afternoon, everybody. My name is Barry Colfer, and I'm the Director of Research here at the IIEA in Dublin. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this, our first event in the 2024 IIEA Disability Policy Series. So the second year we've run this series, but the first year of 2024. Today, we're going to hear about inclusivity for persons with disabilities, the electoral rights of persons with disabilities in the European Union. And we're absolutely thrilled and indeed honoured to be joined by our speaker, Alejandro Maledo, who's the Deputy Director of the European Disability Forum. Anything around um, inclusivity, electoral rights are always important, especially for a public policy think tank such as ours. But just this year, when so much of the world is going to vote and participate in elections, it feels all the more important. Alejandro is going to be chaired and moderated today by someone who will be known to many of you on the call. Dr. Vivian Rath is uh, good enough to chair these events on behalf of the IIEA, and it's much appreciated, Vivian. Vivian is a well-known human rights activist and defender, and he's a research fellow at Trinity College Dublin. Just the final word for me, uh, for those of you on the call, there is Irish Sign Language interpretation available. Many thanks to our interpreter, and there will also be closed captions. Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to hand over to Viv. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much, Barry. Uh, that's a, it's a pleasure, as always, to be here uh, on these sessions. And it's hard to believe that this is number four uh, of the sessions focusing on disability that the IAEA has, has run. And they've been very successful. And thank you to the IAEA for moving the dial that little bit more forward and working to in, in, ensure the greater inclusivity of all disabled people and ensuring that we have a place at this discussion table as well. So thank you, Barry, for that. Uh, it's with great delight that we're joined today by Alejandro Maledo, uh, Deputy Director of the European Disability Forum, who has been generous uh, to, to enough to give us his time. I just want to note, though, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, for our webinars, uh, it's important to note that the in initial address and the Q&A session are on the record, unless otherwise stated. Um, I would ask you to submit your questions uh, via the Q&A function uh, on Zoom. And we really welcome questions because in actual fact, some of the most interesting parts of the discussion result from your questions. So please do uh, send them in. We would ask that when you're putting in your question, that you identify yourselves and your affiliation before uh, asking the speaker a question. So that's quite important. Please endeavor to ensure uh, that uh, you take maybe some time to maybe tweet. And we're, our handle is at, at, or sorry, at IIEA. And we welcome the tweets because it's important to keep that discussion going on afterwards. So Alejandro will speak for about 20 or 25 minutes, and then we will have our Q&A. In his address, Mr. Maledo will give an overview of the findings of the European Disability Forum Sixth Human Rights Report, which is entitled Political Participation of People with Disabilities. The report outlines the legal and practical barriers that persons with disabilities face when exercising their electoral rights in the EU elections across the 27 EU member states. This includes the right to vote, the right to stand as a candidate, the accessibility of the elections, proceedings, facilities or materials and accommodations for independent and secret voting. A reminder today again, just that our pre this presentation is on the record. And I just want you to I just want to say a few words about uh, Mr. Maledo now as well. As mentioned, he's the Deputy Director of the European Disability Forum, and he leads and coordinates the EDF's advocacy and policy work at EU level. He also supports the work of the European Parliament Disability Interreg Group. Mr. Maledo is also a member of the, Sp the Spanish Blind Organization ONCE, O-N-C-E for which he previously worked as a journalist and regional representative of young visually impaired people. I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Mr. Maledo at the recent National Disability Authority uh, Conference uh, in Ireland, uh, where he, he also presented on this work. And I think you're really going to find it extremely interesting. Uh, Alejandro, 
you can now take the stage. Thanks to many, many thanks, Vivian, and many thanks as well uh, to II. Um, EA to for the for the kind invitation to 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 present to you the work of uh, the European Disability Forum in regards to um, political participation and more particularly uh, the electoral rights of persons with disabilities. Um, can I have my my slides on and we can yeah there you go. So next slide please. So. I'll try to to make it as uh, as brief as as possible, but uh, I will uh, show you um, the, the 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 findings and the and the main recommendations of our human rights report. Um, but first, uh, let me introduce uh, the European Disability Forum for those of you who don't know us. We are the advocacy organization uh, representing persons with disabilities at European level. We have over 100 member organizations, uh, members at European level, such as the European uh, Blind Union, the European Union of the Deaf, the European Federation of Hard of Hearing, Inclusion Europe, and those organizations at national level that represent the disability um, community. Uh, in the case of Ireland, um, uh, DFI. So we are uh, run by persons with disabilities and their families for persons with disabilities. And our goal is basically to ensure that the EU uh, implements the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And we do so by uh, involving uh, the European disability movement in the policy making at European level, following the motto that we all know, <laughs> all know in the disability movement, nothing about us without us. Next slide, please. So um, this series of the Human Rights Report, uh, we recently, well, we launched um, last year the seventh Human Rights Report on employment. And this year we will uh, issue the report looking at uh, equality before the law. So uh, looking at the how member states are moving away, hopefully, from substituted decision making to supported decision making. So what we do in this series is to take one of the articles of the CRPD. In the case of today's presentation, we will look at Article 29 on political participation. And we really look at um, the indicators that could help us to compare and find good practices and, um, and solutions in, in the implementation by, by the EU member states, uh, drawing some recommendations for national and European policy makers. In the case of this human rights report, the political participation, we, uh, as it was mentioned, we looked at the legal, but also the practical barriers that prevent persons with, with disabilities from exercising their political rights. We looked at mostly uh, the um, European uh, Parliament elections, also a uh, little bit on municipal elections because, as you may know, uh, the EU citizenship also grants us with the possibility to vote for the European Parliament and for municipal elections in another member state that we reside in. So in my case, for example, I'm Spanish, but I live in Belgium and I could and I actually do vote in the Belgian municipal elections. But I can decide whether I vote for the European, um, so that for the European Parliament elections, with Belgian candidates or with Spanish candidates. Um, we looked at in this report, not only on those kind of barriers for the European Parliament elections, uh, both legal and practical, but we also looked at cases that brought substantial change at national level. So those cases in which our members run uh, a campaign to change the law, those cases of uh, strategic litigation also run by disability activists and by disability organizations. And we conclude by some recommendations again for national and European um, policymakers. And at the end of my presentation, I will also give you a, a little bit of an overview on the different advocacy campaigns that we have undertaken in this regard. So to uh, ensure the right to vote of persons with disabilities, the right to stand as candidate and the accessibility of the European elections, of, of all elections in the end. Next slide, please. So let's go into the in uh, into the topic. Let's say, so um, actually we um, 
we do have now 705 uh, members of the European Parliament, MEPs. They will soon become uh, 720 in, in the upcoming uh, European Parliament elections this June. And uh, just a, a brief note on, on the number of MEPs, less than 5% of them, uh, according to our knowledge, have a, a disability. So still not fully representative of the 15% of the total population that persons with disabilities represent. For the European elections, even, even if we talk about European elections, we cannot say that this is just one election. In, in reality, these are 27 uh, national elections. At European level, we, uh, as a matter of fact, we do not have um, an electoral management body uh, to oversee the European elections. So this kind of variety and diversity of uh, electoral systems at national level make, makes it challenging to, to come up with kind of harmonized recommendations on how to make the European elections accessible and inclusive to persons with disabilities. But nevertheless, we found uh, some grounds and some possibilities to uh, advocate for this. And I will get into that a little bit later. So um, let's move on to the, um, to the different systems that we have in, in Europe. I will not spend too much time on this. Next slide, please. Basically, um, in the EU, we have three uh, different voting systems. We have two countries, one of them, Ireland, in which you have single transparent, uh, single trans transferable vote. And then in, um, in, nine, in 19 countries, we have uh, the possibility of a preferential vote, whereas in, na in six countries uh, in the European Union, the lists are closed. So you just pick um, the political parties, um, ballot paper and you cannot have a preferential uh, vote. You just go with whatever the party has decided. This is the case of my home country, Spain, for example. So uh, next slide. This variety in the way we vote also poses, as you can imagine, some uh, challenges when it comes to how to make the casting the vote accessible, because in some countries you need to uh, write an X, in other countries you need to circle the candidate that you want to vote for. In some countries you need to use, in Romania, for example, you need to use a special uh, stamp on a small booklet. Um, in country, in some countries, you even need to write uh, the name of the. You can write the name of the of the candidate. The candidate in uh, Belgium, for example, we have uh, voting machines. In Estonia, you can vote uh, through a website or uh, or through your mobile phone. So you can see this variety in how we cast the vote also needs to take into consideration in how we ensure the inclusivity of the of the elections. Next slide. In addition to how we vote, there are different ways in which we can exercise uh, this right. So um, now I will show you some data on the different modalities or the different means uh, for voting that uh, people have in Europe. Some of these solutions are actually put forward just for persons with disabilities, but here we kind of compile uh, those uh, alternative and advanced means of voting that are available in, uh, in the European Union. So we have person in person early voting that is available in 11 countries so you go to a to a location and this obviously can be convenient for certain persons with disabilities if such location is accessible to them and um, they can avoid the the, the the election day if they wish so and um, vote more calmly uh, if possible in this kind of early uh, voting uh, place next slide we also have um, uh, we also have nine countries. Well, actually now ten uh, because Greece uh, is uh, actually right now reforming their electoral law and they are including uh, postal voting, so the possibility to vote uh, by post. And this again, this can be a convenient solution for persons with disabilities. So you can decide your uh, your vote at home using your own assistive technology, for example, or with the assistance of a of a person of trust. And you can vote by by post, so you avoid going to into the polling station and the hassle of going to 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 the on election day. So 
these possibilities are in some cases convenient for certain persons with disabilities. Uh, which obviously, but I will get into that in a moment, this doesn't mean that countries shouldn't make uh, efforts to make the polling stations accessible for persons with disabilities, obviously. Next slide. We also have the possibility in a number of countries to change or choose the polling station that is most accessible or most convenient to you. This is obviously something that uh, many persons with disabilities um, uh, value in uh, the, the, the possibility of, of choosing um, this polling station. Next slide. And lastly, the, another possibility which is put forward uh, in many cases for persons with disabilities and for people living in, in, in residential settings is to have the, 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 the ballot box to come to your place. Uh, so a mobile um, uh, election commissioner come to your place and you can exercise the right to vote. In some countries, in the case of um, of uh, let me just check the numbers of four countries. This is only possible in certain locations, so in hospital, in in residential institutions, but in uh, in many countries in the EU, uh, fifteen to be uh, more uh, precise, uh, this possibility is available again. Uh, in many cases to persons with disabilities, even if in some countries we notice that the paperwork and the procedure to request this mobile ballot box is, is, is difficult. Next slide. So now we move to the legal. Uh, this is kind of the, the context and now we'll move into the legal and practical barriers preventing persons with disabilities from exercising their electoral rights. First, we'll start with the right to vote and the right to stand as candidate. Next slide. With regards to the right to vote, uh, as you uh, may know, um, certain countries restrict this right to people under total or partial guardianship. Fortunately, we've seen and is um, shown in the report that lately there's been progress in EU countries in changing these kind of double standards as for persons mostly with intellectual and psychosocial disabilities. So we see more and more countries that are ensuring that everyone, regardless of whether you are under um, guardianship, can exercise their right to vote. And here I'm very, very glad to, to tell you that there are two countries that recently have amended their laws to ensure that everyone, uh, including those under uh, guardianship, under total or partial um, substituted uh, decision-making regimes, can actually exercise the right to vote. This is the case of Luxembourg, who, which changed their law last uh, June, and Slovenia, who changed it very, very recently. And for the first time, 3,500 people uh, under guardianship will exercise, will be able to exercise the right to vote in the upcoming European elections. So now, all in all, finally, we have more than half of the EU member states ensuring that everyone, without exception, have the right to vote in the upcoming European elections. The number now is 15, not 13 as in the in the number on the slide. Sorry, this is uh, this needs to be uh, updated with the with the graphing designer. But for the moment, I just pasted the the, the names of the countries that have joined. Let's say the the progress on implementing the UNCRPD. Then regardless, the, um, with regards to the countries that do exclude uh, all or certain persons with disabilities, we have countries in which um, certain persons with disabilities on a case by case case, uh, on a case, uh, case by case basis are uh, deprived of the right to vote. This number has gone down to six now and countries in which regardless if you are under total or partial guardianship as long as uh, as soon as you are put into this substituted decision making regime you automatically lose your right to vote. So these are the countries that really need to uh, speed up their uh, implementation of the of the UN convention on the rights of persons with disabilities. Next slide please. 
which is um, the right to stand as candidate. And here we see that um, with the recent changes in Luxembourg and Slovenia, uh, we have 10 uh, EU countries in which persons with disabilities, regardless of their legal capacity, can stand as candidate to the European Parliament election. This is uh, unfortunate that uh, some countries do believe that certain people have the right to vote, but not the right to be a candidate. But this is the way it is. And we are uh, working to promote that more and more uh, candidates are persons with uh, disabilities. Next slide, please. We move now to the practical barriers. So we, we will look at what, how we can ensure that persons with disabilities have equal access to the elections. Next slide. And here we will look at three uh, aspects. First, accessibility. So accessibility uh, of the proceedings, the materials, the information about the elections. So not only the polling station or how to cast the, the vote. We will also look at reasonable accommodation in the case of uh, electoral rights. In, and here, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, is key to ensure that um, those alternative and adv advanced means of voting are available so persons with disabilities can choose what is most convenient or preferable to them, as well as the possibility of using assistive tools and services to vote independently and in secret, which is um, something that in the case of persons with disabilities is not always ensured. And in this same vein, uh, we also look at the free choice of assistance, which, as you will see in a moment, is not guaranteed, despite this being explicitly mentioned in the convention that persons with disabilities have the right to choose a person of their trust to assist them in, in, in voting if they wish so. In certain EU member states, this is not possible and you can only be assisted by a, an election uh, official in the polling station, which obviously is problematic. Next slide. Going into the accessibility, the first uh, pillar of uh, of this um, of this section, here we uh, we start obviously with uh, how accessible are the ballot papers, or how accessible is the um, casting the vote. Because as I mentioned uh, before, in some cases, if you need to write or to circle the 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 name of the candidate that you want to have a preferential vote for, this obviously poses problems for people like myself, for example, with a visual disability. So in the case of ballot papers, for example, in the case of Luxembourg that I just mentioned in the reform, they also introduced um, um, certain elements to make uh, the ballot paper more accessible, more usable, not only for persons with disabilities, but also for everyone actually. So looking at the contrast of the ballot paper or the font, uh, in Norway, for example, in their legislation, they even specify the, the font type and the font size of the ballot paper to ensure the legibility of the of the um, of the ballot paper and the understandability. So I know in Ireland, for example, you also made some changes in your ballot paper to to improve the understandability and the usability of it. And obviously, and as in every aspect concerning accessibility, there is always room for improvement. Um, concerning the re required task, what I mentioned, like how to mark the preferential vote. This is also um, uh, a challenge that can be uh, overcome in certain cases with assistive technology that we will show in a moment. And in the case of Estonia, which is the only country in which they vote through, they can vote as an early vote uh, through the internet, through a website, this website, which you can access through your computer or through your uh, mobile phone, it complies with the web accessibility standard. So it's an accessible way for persons with disabilities to vote if they don't want to go to the polling station and do it and doing it in, in person. Um, concerning the only two countries that use uh, voting machines, uh, Belgium is one of them and Bulgaria is another one. Uh, unfortunately, the voting machines that we have in uh, Europe uh, do not include uh, much accessibility uh, features on it. So this is this is still uh, a huge room for, for improvement. In the US, they have advanced uh, on, on in this aspect as they use voting machines, but 
nevertheless, the disability community is not yet totally satisfied with the level of accessibility. But again, accessibility, uh, there is always room uh, for uh, improvement. Next slide. If we look at beyond the uh, the the ballot paper and we look at the legislation, we see that now uh, 19 countries, because Austria uh, joined uh, this group as well, have introduced direct or indirect uh, legal provision as for the built environment that would cover polling stations. Again, sometimes they think of accessibility in a very narrow way, thinking only of people uh, using wheelchairs. So uh, here is where we see like good practices in certain member states in which they look at also the accessibility of people with intellectual disabilities or people with uh, other forms of disability, not just, you know, um, reduce mobility, which, which is great. Um, next slide. And then if we look at the election information, which is obviously uh, very important as well. We've seen that even if the European, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the national uh, election management bodies uh, have different levels of, of accessibility of their uh, websites and, and communication, we do see that more and more member states are uh, cooperating actually with uh, disability organizations to produce materials and to inform about the accessibility and the possibilities of the elections in place. And in the case of um, five um, uh, election management bodies, for example, if I'm not mistaken, uh, they do provide specific information about the accessibility of the polling station, which is obviously uh, very useful for persons with disabilities. Next slide. Then um, another, important elements of the of the elections are the the, the political parties no and the and the media we do have a certain legislation that uh, ensures uh, that um, audiovisual audiovisual media services are uh, or should become uh, progressively uh, are accessible to persons with disabilities and this could obviously cover uh, information related to to the elections like um, candidates debates or interviews with candidates and so forth and we do see that some countries have really good practices in making a political content uh, more accessible to persons with disabilities uh, but uh, on the other side the political parties uh, remain as a kind of like a voluntary uh, basis and um, this really depends on the political will of this uh, of these parties to make their information and their communications more accessible there is no law obliging them to do so next slide please and uh, moving on to the second pillar, so reasonable accommodation, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, if we combine the provision of this alternative and advanced means of voting and the provision of assistive tools, we see that most EU member states, they do have um, certain... Uh, sorry? Ah, I, I've heard... So we see that um, some uh, the majority of member states, they do have um, the possibility of ensuring um, uh, the provision of um, reasonable accommodation through uh, these means, uh, 23 in, in total. Only four countries do not have uh, any kind of these alternative means for voting or do not provide um, assistive tools to ensure uh, that you can vote independently and in secret. In two of these four countries, uh, France and Belgium, for example, they they claim that having a pro the possibility of a proxy uh, voting for you, which is possible in Belgium and, and, and France, you give the possibility for another person to vote on your behalf, uh, they do they do claim that this could be considered as an alternative uh, means of voting, but from our point of view, this is not uh, a way to claim that you are complying with the uh, with the obligations of the convention to ensure that persons with disabilities can exercise the right to vote. You are passing that duty to a, a third person, which is yeah, it's a, it's a can be a convenient way for for people, but not a way to claim that you are complying with you know uh, your commitments as for disability policies. Next slide. 
Um, yeah, and then, uh, well, this I already mentioned at the beginning, the different ways uh, for voting, uh, early voting or alternative means of voting. So postal voting, in person, changing or choosing your polling station, and the possibility of having an election commission coming to your place of residence. Next slide. And if we look at the provision of assistive tools, we see that many countries, uh, and actually in, 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 a, in a number of them, is thanks to the disability organization cooperating with the electoral management uh, authority, the uh, countries provide uh, certain uh, assistive tools such as braille templates, tactile stencils as well, uh, magnifiers in the, um, in the polling station, lamps, uh, the provision of accessible transport to the polling station, uh, even helplines in sign language, for example. So there is a wide range of possibilities here for member states that, again, it really depends on the voting system that they have at national level. Next slide. And here I uh, included in the slide some pictures on the um, on the uh, these assistive uh, tools. So I believe actually that one of them is from Ireland, tactile uh, tactile uh, stencil on the bottom right side. On the uh, top right, there is a mobile uh, ballot box. And then on the left side of the of the picture, there is, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a Braille uh, kit. So information provided in Braille. Next slide. Um, and then uh, if we look at the secrecy of the vote, uh, this obviously depends on the everything that we've been uh, presenting until now. So the accessibility of the process and the provision of reasonable accommodation. So depending on how uh, well suited these provisions are, the country will be ensuring the possibility of having a secret vote. But in the report, we also note certain countries in which um, the lack of this uh, alternative means of voting or the lack of you know being able to choose uh, a person of trust to assist you in voting could compromise the uh, this principle of the secrecy of the of the vote next slide and this is the case of greece and malta uh, i know that our greek members are at the moment um in discussions with the government to change the law to ensure that uh, persons uh, can uh, persons with disabilities can decide uh, an assistance of their choice and they are not you know obliged to get help from an election official in the polling station and obviously if you think of a small community a small village you may not want to disclose the your vote to uh, to a stranger so uh, our uh, position in this regard is to allow persons with disabilities to decide uh, whom will assist them in casting the vote. Next slide. And um, we come to the end of my presentation um, concerning the recommendations that we draw from all these findings and uh, information. We just uh, want to make sure that uh, countries or so national electoral laws or European electoral law, if we, if we ever have a, a good one, uh, will guarantee that everyone has the right to vote and the right to stand as candidate, regardless of legal capacity status. We obviously, from EDF, we um, are against any kind of substituted decision-making regime. Uh, and we welcome very much the progress that you've been making in Ireland in this regard with the new law on supported decision-making. Uh, we really hope it's it's a success. Um, but uh, for the sake of ensuring the electoral rights of persons with disabilities, we want to decouple, let's say, the right to vote and the right to stand as candidates or your electoral rights from the uh, legal capacity status. We also uh, promote uh, um, accessibility by uh, requiring member states to maximize the accessibility of the proceedings, the facilities, the materials, the information of their elections, but cater to their 
uh, culture to their voting system, the voting uh, culture that they have at national level, because uh, have you seen in my presentation, the diversity of systems we have in Europe is immense. Uh, well, immense, maybe a big too big, but quite quite great. And then uh, to provide reasonable accommodation, so different ways of voting that are convenient for everyone, not only for persons with disabilities. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, that was uh, proven again in Croatia, for example, when uh, not only persons with disabilities use the mobile ballot uh, boxes, people that could, that could not leave their homes had to use these ballot um, boxes as well, these mobile ballot boxes as well. So uh, the provision of alternative and advanced means of voting if for all voters or for persons with disabilities uh, are a way to ensure that people have a convenient way to exercise their right to vote and the provision of assistive technologies that can facilitate that you can do it alone, independently and at your ease is also important. And lastly, which is obvious and actually is explicit in the UN convention is to ensure that everyone can choose the the person to assist them in and as i mentioned in different parts of my presentation one key success factor that we uh, highlight in the report is that in those countries in which uh, the electoral authority has cooperated with the disability organization uh, is where it has worked the best because at the end of the day uh, we are the experts of our own lived experiences and knowing the uh, the say the par uh, peculiarities of the voting system at national level, the organization of persons with disabilities and the electoral authorities can do really uh, work well together in finding these solutions to improve accessibility or introduce these kind of measures to ensure um, a reasonable accommodation. Next slide. And I think they will be my last one. Well, this is the promotion one. So um, I, I can paste the, the, the link on, on, on the chat box, but you can easily find it online. The report, I'm happy that is outdated thanks to this kind of uh, progress in Luxembourg, in Greece and in Slovenia. And I hope that it will get more and more outdated. Uh, we need to find a way to update the, ma the maps. And then this last uh, slide is to briefly mention the policy, um, the advocacy that we've been carrying out at, uh, at EDF concerning the persons with disabilities and the uh, political participation. The European Parliament has proposed a new uh, EU electoral law because, believe it or not, we have the same kind of rules since 1976. Um, and, um, and in this, uh, we have worked very closely with the European Parliament and we managed to include uh, the recommendations or most of the recommendations that I just mentioned in this proposal to the Council. The Council is the EU institution that represents our uh, national governments, our countries, and is the Council the only institution that can decide on an EU electoral law. So the Parliament has proposed, but it's a prerogative of the Council to decide if they take it or not. And for the moment, they have not taken it. Uh, it's a different story. The rights of uh, citizens like myself, mobile EU citizens, uh, you know, residing in another EU member state. Here is the Commission that has the authority uh, to propose new legislation, and they have introduced uh, new legislation of, as for the electoral rights of mobile EU citizens like myself. So here we managed to include also some um, improvements as for accessibility of the elections or the information to the mobile um, citizens. So this uh, legislation actually have, uh, in my view, uh, this is a personal opinion, more chances to be adopted in the near future, not for these uh, upcoming elections in June, but I believe this, these uh, directives will be adopted. And then uh, more recently, and uh, good to, to check, uh, the Commission has released uh, one of the actions of the disability strategy. It's a guide, so it's not, it's not, not binding, but it's a good source of information, like our report, on a guide on good electoral practices for the participation of persons with disabilities in elections. Uh, you, I, I hope they can distribute this, these slides to you so you have easily accessible the, the links. 
um, this guide kind of gathers these kind of best, best practices or projects at national level uh, for the political participation of persons with disabilities. And at the annex of this guide, uh, the Commission has included some sort of guidance because even though it's titled guide, it's not guiding much, it's just a compendium of good practices, but good food for thought or for inspirations uh, at national level on how to, how to improve the, the voting system. Uh, so it's just worth mentioning. The Commission also released a recommendation to member states in which they uh, they mentioned that the persons with disabilities should be uh, granted the, the right to vote. But in this case, they did not uh, use uh, our approach as for, you know, regardless of legal capacity status, they uh, recommend member states to do uh, at the minimum, like a case by case uh, basis. So with the possibility for the person to, to seek uh, redress uh, or at the court to challenge that decision. But uh, we believe that by default, everyone should have the right to vote. So we were not so uh, satisfied, so pleased with the approach taken by the Commission in this regard. And lastly, in case uh, you are interested, the, the OSCE also released a set of recommendations concerning the political participation of persons with disabilities. And uh, next slide, and I think that's uh, that's it. Ah, no, I included one more, sorry. I think I'm talking too much, but I will stop now. Basically, just to tell you about our plans for the upcoming European elections. I mean, this is a, an advocacy campaign that we are running to ensure the right to vote of persons with disabilities to improve the accessibility of the elections. But this is not all, obviously. From the European disability movement, we are as we always do, we are putting forward political proposals like new ideas for the European Commission, the European Parliament and the Council of the EU to really improve the, the living conditions of persons with disabilities, uh, to put forward legislation that that can uh, go down, uh, well, go down, uh, be transposed, let's say, at national level uh, for our members at national level also to have uh, this possibility to go beyond and uh, and really uh, push for the implementation of the CRPD. So we have this manifesto for the upcoming European elections with loads of proposals. I think there are over 80. And uh, based on the manifesto, we have uh, recently launched a disability rights pledge that we hope you can distribute among your candidates uh, to become MEPs in June. It's a pledge to commit, you know, to work together with the disability movement, to implement the convention, to revise the current um, European disability strategy, to re-establish the European Parliament Disability Intergroup in the Parliament because this is not a given. It needs to be re-established every term and for these MEPs to join the, the intergroup. So it's just a one-pager that candidates you know, commit to defend disability rights. We also at EDF have um, developed um, certain guidelines or checklists for political parties and candidates to run their campaigns, their communications, their events in an accessible manner. So it's kind of a, a easy to digest uh, entry point into accessibility and how to make your communication, social media, meetings, etc., accessible. So you can access through that link as well. And our third kind of big objective of this uh, campaign or this European elections campaign is to ensure, as I said before, that we have more policymakers with disabilities. At the moment, we have barely 5% of the total European Parliament uh, with disabilities, and we want to see more people with disabilities uh, as members of the European Parliament. So I stop there. I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think that was the last slide. Yay. Good. Alejandro, thank you very much. Uh, Sorry, I, I yeah. talked a lot. Uh, no, that's okay. I mean, there is a lot of information to cover, uh, and it really it was a really insightful presentation and and I know because I've read uh, the EDF report on this that is only a snapshot of the amount of detail and the amount of information that is in that report so I think you did extremely well to capture so much of it uh, and in such a broad way uh, and what I what I really liked of course is that you detailed the many barriers that exist but you also outlined some of the successes and some of the positive actions that are being taken in countries. And I think that's really important because 
it also outlines to other countries or demonstrates to other countries that they, they can make changes and these changes uh, make a significant difference to the lives of disabled people and when we just think about it and just for our audience here today that uh, in 2022 uh, the EU population over the age of 16, 27% of the EU population over the age of 16 had some form of disability. So when we look at that, that's about 101 million people or one in four people, or four people, uh, adults in the EU, I should say, uh, with disability. So it, it's a huge amount of people uh, that are uh, a huge voting bloc uh, who have rights uh, and in many cases these rights are denied and I I'm, I know you spoke about uh, that the fact that there are some barriers that exist to people um, with maybe psychosocial disabilities or mental health difficulties or intellectual disabilities that actually prevents them from voting altogether and I think there's some uh, kind of an estimation and you can you can correct me if I'm wrong Alejandro but I think it's put in around the 800,000 uh, EU citizens uh, you may be deprived of the right to participate in elections because of their disabilities yeah I mean Alejandro that's phenomenal yeah, yeah. amount of people yeah, yeah. It, it got reduced in the uh, um, during these past years because of those uh, big countries um, changing their national laws like Germany, uh, France, uh, Spain as well, they, uh, in fact. So it got reduced to, um, it's, it is estimated that around 400,000 now. So, uh, yeah. yeah. But still, uh, uh, it's still much. a colossal yeah. number of yeah. of people who mm. who are being disenfranchised, mm. uh, and not only that, but I mean the impact that must have on their sense of belonging in Europe, yeah, yeah, yeah. their sense of community, and the the failure to be involved in the decision making process. So, and um, look, I mean, there are there are a number of questions after coming in, Alejandro. Uh, have you had an opportunity to catch your breath? Because yes, you have to get some. <laughs> You have to get some quick fire questions in now between between now and we always finish at one p.m. Uh, or sorry, two p.m. Uh, here. Uh, so we we try to keep it on time, you yeah. know. Uh, so I'm going to um, uh, our first question came in from Emma Richardson, a uh, Richard, a researcher, uh, with the IIEA. Um, so the question reads as following follows. Okay, you mentioned that less than five percent of current MEPs are persons with disabilities. As many people are now coming to understand, not all disabilities are visible. Do you yep. think that candidates for the EU Parliament should identify their personal disabilities when becoming candidates, and could this be done to benefit disability awareness in general? That's a good question. question, and I forgot. Uh, that's a really good question, and I forgot to mention that. That uh, I mean, we uh, we um, we calculated ourselves this uh, percentage of five percent, but obviously uh, this is based on our knowledge. So either because it's a visible disability, or because the MEP uh, himself or herself uh, openly disclosed uh the disability this doesn't mean that uh, there may be others uh other meps with the disab invisible disabilities so it's a really good point uh it, it, the case of uh candidates disclosing whether they have a disability or not i think this is as as always uh our position is that this is up to the person to to decide if they want to disclose or not their disability um yeah, and sometimes even um, it, it is we 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 tend to 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 see that the, some policymakers think that because an MEP or a policymaker has a disability, that person should be working on disability policies, and it's not the case. It shouldn't be the case. Persons with disabilities can be working, and we do have actually in this legislative term we have had. Uh, MEPs with disabilities that have not disclosed their disability or with a visible disability, but that were not that active on disability matters. And it's totally, totally fine because disability should be everywhere. It's, yeah. uh, it's part Absolutely. of the diversity of uh, our society. Totally. Yeah. And, and I think, of course, Alejandro, and, and you would know this as well from your work, is that disclosing a disability is a very personal uh, yeah. point and 
many uh, may have experienced uh, negative perceptions and negative and uh, criticisms in relation to disability in their lifetime yeah. and may not feel comfortable doing it. But what I noticed, Alejandro, and I just wanted to bring your point, you mentioned that uh, that 5% figure. Um, mm. And that's actually, uh, if I'm correct in saying, that's considered quite high because if uh, I know in some research that was done um, in the last year or two, I think the, in, in the UK and across other different countries in Europe, that in terms of their local parliaments or local areas, that it was it, that level of representation was one percent and less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but still far from the fifteen oh, percent. Huh? Entirely. I mean, I'm not. I'm not celebrating five percent uh, by <laughs> no means. Uh, we, we, unfortunately, we have no idea of the figure here in Ireland. And in actual fact, if you don't mind me saying so, uh, myself uh, and two other colleagues, Eleanor Flynn. Uh, in University College Galway and of course Aoife Price in University Galway and myself are doing some research in this elections mm. uh, on the experiences of disabled candidates uh, and this will be the first time that kind of research has been done here in Ireland but we have no no real idea of how many uh, disabled people are yeah. actually in our current uh, yeah. Uh, government, you know. Um, okay, so I have another question and we, we have to try and get through all of these. Uh, people are very interested. Um, I have a question from Neve Nehybrid and I know Neve. Neve is a, was an alumni of Trinity College Dublin and a, a fantastic journalist. Uh, welcome, Neve. Delighted to have you here. Um, uh, in line with ensuring electoral rights and increased accessibility for people with disabilities, do you expect to see more disabled candidates participating in elections throughout EU member states or is different action required? Uh, we are doing our best, uh, but it's up to the political parties to also uh, set the 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 right context let's say um, we all I mean in what what we've seen in the presentation that we have a a wide uh, variety of uh, of, um, of voting systems, uh, but at the end of the day, it's also uh, in all our countries we have uh, more or less uh, strong political parties that they should have also um, the responsibility of making their meetings, their headquarters, their communication and and their information accessible and inclusive and to proactively approach their members with disabilities because persons with disabilities also have different ideologies sometimes it seems like we should also have the uh, since we have a disability no 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 um, we all have different uh, ideologies different political views and uh, parties should make a proactive effort this is our view to approach persons with disabilities and to include them in their in their tickets and we we've sent letters to the eu political parties but as you know well uh, even these are european elections the candidates are decided by the national parties so it is really really uh, a campaign that will be mostly led by national uh, disability activists and uh, disability organizations to reach out to the political parties to really encourage them to 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 approach persons with disabilities and include them and give them a chance and support them as candidates so they can campaign on equal footing with other candidates i think it's very interesting alejandro and you have probably noted this as well that our first two questions uh, today actually relate to disabled people running as candidates yeah uh, do you there think... is an appetite there is an, the... an appetite yes yeah, I, I think there is. And, I, and I'm just thinking, do you think and that countries are taking too narrow a view uh, when it comes to the public and political participation of disabled people? As in, the focus is usually accessibility of voting stations as opposed mm. to considering supports yeah, for yeah. disabled candidates what are your thoughts Alejandro? i think it's shifting i think it's shifting slowly but surely as everything unfortunately but it's shifting and uh, we we have seen progress i i showed uh that there's been progress um uh, in 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 certain elements and uh, we've seen that for example uh the the latest one that we we have the the um 
the changes in Slovenia and in Luxembourg. In Luxembourg, for example, they also took this opportunity to make their uh, ballot paper more accessible. And uh, in, in Slovenia, since they changed the national law, they not only changed it for persons with disabilities under guardianship to be able to vote, but also to be able to stand as candidates. So, uh, but nevertheless, as we showed in the, in the slide, the number of countries ensuring the right to vote regardless of legal capacity status, is higher than those ensuring the right to stand as candidates. So we still see this kind of uh, double standard, if you wish, uh, that, that that is not yet there. But we see the progress, at least. Mm. Well, and I, I think, you know, uh, it's great as well to see, uh, and you can help me with the pronunciation, Alejandro, uh, Mar Galassel Irian, uh, making history in Spain, uh, which uh -huh. was... Am I right in pronouncing that correct? You mean the the MP with uh with intellectual disability? Yes, that's grand. Yeah, yeah, Mar yeah. Margal Seran. Yeah, uh, yeah. She's uh, in my uh, in my region in Valencia. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it's it's it it's fantastic um, that somebody is breaking the mold, but I'm sure uh, mm. that that person had to overcome uh, very significant uh, societal challenges uh, in order to to access mm -hmm. that but it hopefully we can see more of that in the future yeah um, and yeah. oh, okay so we have another question in here from Dorothy Stewart thank you Dorothy uh, Dorothy asked the question voter apathy is also a challenge across many countries, regardless regardless of ability. And is this accounted for in your figures presented? Sorry, I didn't understand. So vo voter apathy. Ah, voter apathy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but that's a that's a condition that uh, that affects us all as society, not just persons with disabilities. Mm. But yeah, I think this is. Um, yeah, this is this is serious, and um, and from 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 our let's say uh, bit of responsibility as the European Disability uh, European Disability Forum, we are doing our best to to try to show why voting in the European elections is important. I think we have launched, uh, we are launching actually, we are preparing materials on reasons to vote, like uh, it's not only the you know electing. MEPs that have big, big salaries and all. It's about your rights as a passenger. It's about the accessibility of products and services in the whole uh, EU internal market. It's about uh, anti-discrimination laws when you travel across countries. It's about the European Disability Card. It's about you know, there are so many competencies that affect our everyday life that are decided at European level that what we are trying to do is to compile them. And we have a great report, by the way, that I didn't include in the slide. It's called Your Rights in the EU. We will we will revise it this year. And here we kind of compile all the rights that persons with disabilities have uh, achieved at European level. So uh, this is what it's, it's at stake. So it's not only the proposals that we as disability movement are putting forward to political parties. It's about, you know, the rights that we have that are not, you know, set on stone. If tomorrow we have, uh, you know, all the Eurosceptics taking over uh, the parliament and the commission and basically going backwards, I mean, we could lose uh, rights in Europe. So Absolutely, uh, Alejandro, yeah. absolutely. So, and I, and I think that's a really good point there that you're making that, uh, and there's an article in one of the papers in in Ireland here at the moment in where, uh, you know, the, the comment is that it's important to use our vote to see the change, that, you know, the, the change that we want. Mm. Uh, so, and I think that's, you're, you're making that point. The, the last uh, question here before we finish, uh, Alejandro, is that is from Kieran Finlay. Hi, Kieran. I, I know Kieran as well. Uh, we have a very good Irish contingent here today, uh, Alejandro. So um, lots of interest from Ireland. Uh, Kieran Finlay is in the National Disability Authority. Um, he asked the question, uh, Alejandro mentioned plans to revise the EU Electoral Act. Mm -hmm. What are the key changes that the EDF would like to see as part of this updated legislation to strengthen the voting rights of persons with disabilities mm -hmm. in line with the UNCRPD? Yeah, I can tell you because th that's already kind of uh, um, done in a way. So we included... Um, the right to vote regardless of legal capacity status. 
um, the, all of this is in the parliament proposal for a new EU electoral law that member states, they need to agree on, but they haven't yet. And they will not in the near future from my um, personal uh, opinion, because it has other more uh, controversial proposals on it. So first I will tell the disability related um, uh, um, uh, parts, uh, provisions of this uh, proposal that are good. And I think they are not contested by member states. So in this case, it's kind of good that our parts are not that controversial. So the right to vote, regardless of legal capacity, unfortunately, there is not the right to stand as candidate, regardless of uh, legal capacity. So the right to vote, yes, but the right to stand is not there. The obligation for member states to maximize accessibility the obligation to member states to provide reasonable accommodation to persons with disabilities to vote independently and in secret, and the obligation to ensure that persons with disabilities can uh, choose their assistance of their choice, and the accessibility of the European campaigns. The campaigns run at European level by European political parties or European movements, as they call it. So these are kind of the, the, the good improvements as for persons with disabilities. The problem is that this new electoral law that the parliament has put forward has other controversial things that the member states are not so happy to accept. Like, for example, to make everyone vote on the same day. They propose the 9th of uh, May, which is Europe Day, uh, or to have transnational lists instead of national lists. So we will have a ballot paper with a number of candidates uh, from all EU member states instead of me voting only Spanish and you only uh, Irish candidates. Um, the obligation to have a lead candidate, so the, the first in the list would be considered by the, the president of the, uh, of the European Commission. So it has some kind of other things that for member states is a no-go for the moment. And unfortunately, this is kind of blocking uh, all the positive uh, other positive parts that are included in this proposal from the parliament. Okay. But we'll see, yeah, and uh, in the near future, uh, we can see some amendments concerning only disability uh, rights or, or certain parts of this uh, proposal included and not others. So it's still the, up yes. in the air, yeah. It's, it's, it's very much in the balance still, Alejandro. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, just before we finish up, I've, and this is only a quick... Um, uh, I'm going to give a quick uh, comment here firstly we had a lovely comment in from Maeve Carton thank you Maeve and Maeve just noted Alejandro that it was a fantastic session many thanks to all involved and in particular to Alejandro for his clear informative and insightful presentation and answers and so well done to all our last question for today Alejandro just a quick response on this and I think this is actually a really important question and a great way to wrap up our session today and this is a question from Barry Colfer the Director of Research here in the IIEA he just noted thanks for the presentation uh, can you please say what the cost of government in action would be when it comes to electoral rights of people with disabilities both as candidates and participants so in what way is society worse off in such a scenario? A quick response, Alejandro. Oh, that's a difficult question. A quick response, I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's a good way to wrap up, Alejandro. Yeah, no, I think that the cost of not uh, of having um, uh, uh, non fully complete uh, or inclusive democracy is huge because uh, in the end, you cannot claim yourself democratic if you have uh, first class citizen and second class citizen. So uh, our democracies reflect a little bit the society that we want to be. So I would leave it there. I mean, if okay. we are truly about our diversity, uh, our democracy should re really reflect that. Thank you very much, Alejandro. And I think it's a, a absolutely an important point to make about that we would be less off as a as a country and the world without the voice of all of our citizens exactly. uh, involved in decision making processes. So mm -hmm. on that note, Alejandro, I would like to thank you very much for coming today to uh, to give a really, really insightful presentation. And you can see how much it meant to people by the number of uh, very detailed questions that we received uh, and the uh, the interest that's there. So thank you very much. I'd also thank like you. to thank you, thank Vanessa. Vanessa, thank you for your support. And of course, to the IIEA for hosting this session. And we're looking forward to more sessions during the year. There are some wonderful topics uh, planned for 
uh, later on in the spring and the summer. And we look forward to having you uh, attend those as well. So from all of the team here today, I'd like to wish you all a lovely afternoon, a, a very relaxing weekend. And I look forward to talking to you all again soon. Take care and goodbye. Thank you.